Hello. 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 Hey, everybody. Son. That did work. I left my whistle at home, or whip to crack. Well, we're a couple hours in to Hack for Congress here. It seems like everybody is breaking out into groups, working on projects, and things are humming along quite well. Uh, does anybody need anything that they don't have besides working product that's going to win? <laughs> All right. Well, we are incredibly lucky right now to be joined by our third, count them, third sitting U.S. Senator today, uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal from Connecticut. Uh, Senator Blumenthal was just uh, named the ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Committee, and there are a couple of Veterans Affairs related projects underway, uh, and uh, serves on the Senate Commerce Committee with Senator Wyden, which has jurisdiction over uh, internet and technology related issues. Uh, the senator is an ardent supporter of net neutrality and a free and open internet, and has also uh, shared some of his wonderful uh, Thursday afternoon in session with us. So please give Senator Blumenthal a very warm Hack for Congress welcome. Thank you uh, so much. I am from Connecticut. Do we have anyone here from Connecticut? All right. Where, whereabouts? Uh, born and raised in Glastonbury. Great. And how about? Great. And I saw another hand? No? Well. Darianne, great. Uh, I am here. Uh, I am a sitting, not really sitting, senator, but uh, here as a senator, having served in other positions. Uh, I was the state attorney general of Connecticut for 20 years, elected five times in the state of Connecticut to be the chief civil law enforcement officer. Before that, I was in the state legislature. And before that, I was the chief federal prosecutor, the U.S. attorney. So a lot of my life has been spent in law enforcement. A lot of my public career has involved seeking to implement the law, make it meaningful in people's lives, make people more aware of what their legal obligations are, and using data and evidence in ways that will persuade, persuade juries, persuade legislative colleagues, persuade ordinary citizens, raise awareness. And so using evidence, and I've seen litigation, for example, change. Literally, it's been transformed by the availability of organizing tools and retrieval mechanisms that are the result of new technology. That litigation has changed. Our courts have changed our law enforcement agencies have changed, and our legislative bodies have changed. Uh, I would have considered it inconceivable to see a legislative colleague go to the floor of the state legislature in Connecticut and use a computer. But it is happening all the time. It still is believe it or not, inconceivable to go to the floor of the United States Senate and see a computer or electronic device being used. And that will change. It will change. I will give you just one little story. Uh, I was the presiding officer in the United States Senate in my first couple years, the first few times. I got a little bit bored, of course, not because the speeches were boring. Uh, and I pulled out my BlackBerry and I began using it. And I was told by one of the clerks that I would be thrown out of the Senate if I continued using this device while I was on the floor of the United States Senate. That's going to change because the technology enables people to think more clearly with better information. And the apps that I hope will be designed for legislatures, for government agencies, will make them more informed. But it will also make them better listeners. 
And there are two key points here today for me. The first is that government works when the people in positions like mine are good listeners. There's an adage that God gave us two ears and one mouth, so we do a little more listening than talking. The most important part of what I do as a public official is to listen. You may think, oh, well, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, right? But I will tell you that I go back to Connecticut every weekend. I am around the state nonstop. I am talking to people, but I am mostly listening. And the ideas that I get when I listen to people are the most valuable input, literally, that I receive in any part of my job. They tell me what's really happening, that employment is still very much a goal, unemployment is still very much a problem, that they're concerned about certain consumer issues, that veterans have disability claims that haven't been met and health care needs that are still lacking. And when I come back here, I am armed with information. And the other way I listen is through the correspondence that I received. Obviously, the emails. Uh, we have, we, we use all of the social media, we use all of the means of communication so that we can listen better to what people have to say, so that I can expand beyond the Boy Scout troops and the Rotary Clubs and the parades and all the public events that I do. And I see and hear from a lot of people. I listen to a lot of people. But obviously, Twitter, email, Facebook expand my ability to listen. So if you can help me listen better and then organize the thoughts as they come to me so that I'm able to establish common themes, trends, points of view that are shared, problems that are common, you will help me enormously. That's what I'd like to hire you to do. Help me to listen. Now, I want to listen, right? That's part of my job. I know I have to listen. If you walk from here down Pennsylvania Avenue, you will walk through an array of buildings, a huge cavern of governmental edifice. And as you look at them, I think you'll be struck, as I often am, by how impenetrable they look. Like fortresses, right? I mean, the Department of Justice, I worked as United, as United States Attorney in Connecticut. I spent a lot of time in the Department of Justice. The security to get in is impenetrable, but the building itself looks basically adverse to listening. And a lot of the folks in these buildings are averse to listening as well. They know what they want to do. They know what they think they should do. And we have to find ways to make them listen better so that they are more penetrable, more accessible. You know, access. That's really the other key point that I want to make. Breaking down that impenetrability, the fortress-like face that government puts to a lot of citizens. And it can take a variety of forms. I just mentioned a physical form. But if you look at the rules of federal, the federal rules, the regulatory apparatus, you know, to make a new rule after a statute, we pass a statute. It, it's a law. Very often, it produces then regulations that have to be formulated by an administrative agency so the statute can be implemented. And statutes often can't be implemented until there are regulations in place. The mouthful that I've just given to you, if I were to try to articulate it to most citizens, they would say, I don't understand what that means. 
And most regulations, when they're first published, have a comment period. People can comment. They can send in their reactions. They can state information to the regulatory bodies. Most people don't know about that. And when they do, the rules themselves are difficult to find. So access is not only to a building, it's also to the rules and regulations and the process that it takes to implement and enforce the law. Now, let me give you a practical example. And I hope you'll find it as outrageous as I do. Six years ago, the United States Congress passed a law that was supposed to protect against the efforts of tobacco companies to market to children, to sell products that harm people, regular tobacco products like cigarettes, but also other tobacco products like flavored cigars, e-cigarettes, which have grown in the meantime, which can addict people, particularly children, marketing to children. That law was passed about six years ago. It was a response to efforts over decades. In fact, when I was Attorney General of the state of Connecticut, we sued the tobacco companies, and we won, settled in 1998, imposed new rules, and the Congress passed a law. That law has never been implemented. And the reason is those regulations have never been issued. And most people think, well, we solved that problem because we passed a law, right? But a law is dead letter unless it's really implemented. And if more people knew about the regulations that have been pending and unimplemented, if more people had access to this process, if more people forced the federal government to listen, it would make a huge difference. Here's another example. Talk about veterans. Disability claims for veterans are backlogged. They are absolutely outrageously delayed. And better systems of information would improve the system, the processing of disability claims for veterans. The systems uh, for medical records among the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs are still, years after they were supposed to be completely compatible, still fraught with difficulty. And this has been a constant refrain and criticism, partly because of the way the government buys technology, its procurement of IT has created problems, the most prominent of them, the ACA rollout, affordable care rollout, where, as you will recall, the nationwide debacle that still, in some ways, plagues the Affordable Care Act in terms of public perception. So these kinds of issues of access, of listening, are really consequential for what I do, what the public needs and deserves from governmental agencies, and for what you can do to help us. And I think the good news is here that there are more and more people aware, as you've heard from two of my colleagues this morning, aware of the need to focus on these issues so that we can be better listeners and we can learn more about what citizens really think are the problems and make government really more accessible to them, make the communication as seamless as possible and enable more people to be informed about the potential for how we can help them. So I want to thank you for uh, listening to me today and hope to uh, hear from you when um, you have ideas that you think I should know about. And I know that you're developing a lot of ideas today, and I'm excited by 
uh, the work that you're doing, the work that you have done, and I know I'm going to be hearing more after today about what you've accomplished. Thanks so much. Thank you. So uh, I think it's fair to say that Senator Blumenthal gets it. Um, we have right over there a Veterans Affair casework backload team. Uh, but we as a community uh, wanted to let you know we have your, your back on thank these you. issues and thank you for joining us and make you an honorary civic hacker. Wonderful. For, with thank a you. Hack for Congress t-shirt and our concert poster. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, guys. Well, it's breakout time again. For the rest of the afternoon, we will uh, be seeing you in your groups. And make sure to get back to your groups in case uh, the senator and his staff can walk around and ask you questions, give you feedback. Um, the one thing I'm going to ask of you for the rest of the day, one thing, is you cannot leave the building without it posting on the hack pad or sending to one of us. Now, us, raise our hands. We've got Laylee, we've got Danielle, we've got Chris. One of us send your, the problem you're working on, a team name, and a point of contact for your team. Uh, that is what we will use to schedule the pitches and everything tomorrow. But that's it. So back to hacking, and let us know if you need anything. Thank you very much. <laughs>